Well, welcome, Neil. Welcome, Neil, to Global Digital Week. And we're delighted to have you, Neil. And for people watching, I just want to give them a little bit of information about you. You're a lifelong politician, heavily involved in education on an international field, Europe and Asia. You sit on many boards, you chair many boards, and you're really in the education space, aren't you? And I want to dig deeper into um, your educational uh, experience and go through some of the areas that you've been involved in today. Would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself, Neil? Well, thank you very much, Christina. Um, I have been involved in education, as you say, for a long, long time. Um, and uh, I continue to be so because I think it's actually of fundamental importance to our economy, our society and our role um, in, in the sort of the global sphere. So it seems to me that we have got to get education right. And by that, I mean every education from start to finish, from the, the day you're born until till you can be educated no longer. So that is uh, my uh, approach. And I've always believed that we should have high quality education, education which uh, recognises the changing uh, economy as we see it, um, and also anticipates the role of technology. Yes, Neil, and and, and the, we're in change now. We're in a period of change where what we thought when we were younger has completely changed and our consumers, the people that we're educating, have completely changed. Even different generations have different expectations on how they receive information and, and for example, duration of content, how it's delivered. Have you seen those changes as you've chaired boards throughout your career? Absolutely, I have. Um, you know, when I started off, uh, we were circulated with papers a few days beforehand, etc. Um, and now, of course, it's all by um, uh, electronic uh, activity. And of course, COVID has meant that we're all Zooming and uh, Microsoft Teamsing and so on. Uh, so it's uh, completely changed the way in which we communicate. But the essence of communication hasn't changed, which is it is very important and must be done. Um, my predecessor as Member of Parliament for Stroud, once uh, regretted that uh, the time for cool, calm uh, deliberation would end just because we've got a cable attached between London and Washington. And he was the Foreign Secretary at the time, Lord John Russell. <laughs> well, I, I know that you're heavily involved. You're the Chief Executive of UK-China Culture and Education Cooperation. Now, that's a long title. I want you to tell us about what that is, what it involves, and then I'll ask you a follow-up question on that. Well, thank you, Christina. Uh, UCEC, that's the shortened version, and the one I keep on using, um, uh, is, is a British company charged with the task uh, of finding what's best about Brit uh, education in Britain, chiefly in the early years sector, but not exclusively so, um, and uh, making, it, making it possible for people in China to benefit from it. So that is about choosing the right kind uh, uh, of uh, learning modules, uh, uh, education services and so on, making them uh, uh, adaptable uh, for China and making sure that people can seize, seize them. And that's actually the marketing as aspect of it. So that's really what we do. Uh, we're also interested uh, in creating children's centres or family centres, if you like, uh, they haven't started yet, chiefly because of COVID, but when they do, they'll uh, further enhance uh, our reach into China. That's fabulous. Are you actually thinking of taking it into any other markets? Well, China's pretty big. Um, every <laughs> year, 15 million babies are born. Um, and uh, the, uh, the, the China has plenty of opportunity. But I have actually worked in countries like Myanmar, for example, with a different label, uh, I was actually advising uh, the then Parliament on how to uh, act, really, as a sort of a democratic uh, chamber with the, the usual characteristics of being uh, charged with the task of holding the government accountable and so on. Um, but I actually did a lot in education there as well. So, yes, um, uh, China is not uh, the only place, but I will focus on that for the time being. Well, there'll be many people watching this who are also in the education space. There will also be people watching, if you like, from different governments around the world. And they'll be trying to transfer knowledge from one place to the next. Do you have any guidance or, or warnings about transferring content or courses and knowledge? I think 
the first thing I would say is you've got to remember that lifting up something which looks good in one country might not land particularly well in another unless you take into account cultural differences, uh, differences of process, administration even, and certainly obviously language. Uh, so you have to um, localise, if you like, the material that you are, are uh, taking abroad. Um, and I think the best way to do that is have a, a, the right set of partners in the country to which you are promoting your products. So in the case of UCEC, we've got really good relationships with universities and education institutes in China. And I think that's absolutely critical uh, to, to the success of our, our model. I couldn't agree more because this conference it is about technology, but you've got to have brilliant partners, haven't you? Well thought through partners aligned in the mission that you're trying to move forward. Yes, you do. You've got to choose your partners well um, and develop a relationship with them, which is based on trust, transparency um, and, and ease of exchange of ideas and so on. Um, and uh, I've, I do that. Obviously, between United Kingdom and China, we're challenged by distance. Um, um, but uh, and also the impact of COVID because we can't get to China right now or certainly not easily. Um, so, you know, it's getting up early in the morning and doing the Zoom meetings then and so on. But it really is essential to build relationships. But I do that, of course, in the United Kingdom as well, because, you know, that China is represented here. Uh, and many of our partners who are uh, working with us in this project uh, are based here. So uh, it's also important to take uh, into account their interests, needs and uh um values if you like and it's been it's fair to say that um we were increasingly using technology to communicate the way we are now and with our partners but when it, when covid hit we, we were thrown into it. i think everybody will agree that we all had to start learning tools that we'd had no experience of in the past that's been a challenge for everybody mm. i think that's absolutely right Let's not forget face-to-face -face meetings have their value. Uh, we first met at a face-to-face -face meeting, yes. um, and um, you know I like them. I think that um, Zoom meetings can be often a little bit too transactional, um, yes. and I think that face-to-face -face meetings um, uh, are better for developing ideas and strategy. Um, but a combination of both is really important. Uh, I'm looking forward to getting back out to China because I want to see people face to face um because that's how you can read the body language etc as much as anything else um and uh i do think that all forms of communication need to be used yeah i, I think you're right and what i'm hearing from businesses it's going to be a bit of a hybrid model and i think what's going to happen we're going to start in meeting face to face more because i think most people prefer it but we'll be able to add value to our meetings or take away actions and have quick catch up just like we are now, rather than mm -hmm. waiting for the next meeting. I think things will move faster and be more efficient with the use of technology now for collaboration. Yeah, I think that's uh, exactly right, because, of course, it's easier to follow up um, uh, through uh, this sort of technology um, and so on. But I do think um, you've got to network as well. Um, and you can't just sort of switch on your Zoom and start networking from home. You have to know the people really before you start Zooming. So the networking activity, the networking function is still important and still needs to be done. Yeah, I totally agree. Now, Neil, I'd like to move on to your role as chair of the Person Commission for Education, Work, Life and the Changing Economy. I'm particularly interested in a changing economy because this is an international conference. So many countries are looking to change their, change and adapt what they do for their economy. Do you have any advice or models or best practice or insights that you can share on what you guys were looking at at that time? Well, our, our commission, as you say, was looking at the changing economy and actually thinking about how skills can be uh, cultivated, developed um, uh, across the piece to meet the, the needs of the changing economy. But you need you do need to know what the economy is changing into uh, so that you can plan uh, uh, the skills uh, and requirements going forward. So uh, what are what is happening? Well, obviously, we've talked already about communication, and that's a characteristic which is obviously changing but there are other things as well and that is the type of activity we're doing manufacturing still happens but often in a different way um, it's not sort of uh, 
uh, car manufacturing where cars are coming down the line and one after the other, but quite often um, bespoke models and, and so on. And so you're needing to think about uh, supply chains, you're needing to think about um, the, uh, the workforce that all participates in that. I remember going to a factory uh, in East Germany, uh, a Porsche car factory, where of course at one time the Soviet Union were dominant um, and East Germany was in a communist situation and uh, things weren't very efficient at all. But this uh, car factory looked really good um, and I was impressed by the supply chain. And this really leads me to my first key point about uh, the, with the work of the commission because the supply chain not only included the, ex the obvious like batteries and tires and so on but actually schools colleges and universities porsche were thinking not just about the raw materials but about the human resources and where they came from and how to cultivate them so i think one of the big changes is exactly that and you see that in uh the republic of korea uh, where there's a huge interest with big conglomerates in what the education system is producing so that they can uh, benefit from uh, a workforce which is uh, primed and ready. So yeah. that is one of the big changes, the relationship basically between uh, education providers uh, and, 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 the, and the professions, the employers. I think the next big change um, is the way in which um, customers are able to basically navigate everywhere for anything. Um, and um, it seems to me that that is clearly going to actually encourage more of the bespoke uh, specialist product services requirements. I think it's also going to mean that businesses just simply have to e be even more sure-footed in understanding what the market looks like and reactive to those understandings. So those are the key changes. Um, and I think the uh, final point I would make is that the economies are changing between each other. By that I mean, um, obviously, uh, United States, uh, the European Union have been dominant economic uh, powers and will remain so, but they are being challenged by emerging powers from else, elsewhere, obviously China, but India too, um, and, and other countries as well. And so um, this is not just a question of thinking, well, what am I doing? internally to be competitive we have to be competitive everywhere yeah absolutely neil and i i think it's also important in terms of resilience with with, with climate change and with technology that um, we need to monitor our supply chain ch supply chains because they are now increasingly international global and um, as we put our own agenda together to transform our businesses, our business models and what we do and who we work with, sometimes it's, it's easy to forget that we need to monitor our supply chain, the people who provide us and how resilient are they and how are they advancing in technology? Have you, have you guys had any conversations about that or do you have any insight? Yeah, I think there's several things to say about this, this important area of supply chains. One is actually reputation protecting a reputation. Dyson have recently come into trouble because of uh, sourcing some uh, products from areas in, in Asia, which are just simply not good enough uh, in terms of uh, um, management uh, and treatment of people. Um, and uh, so I think it's really critical that uh, firms recognize this question of reputation. Uh, they don't want to be connected to an outfit which simply has practices which are unacceptable. So that's the first thing. I think the second thing is that uh, you've got to make sure that you've got good relationships with your suppliers, wherever they happen to be. Mm -hmm. Now, the United Kingdom has taken the extraordinary decision to make things harder for most of its supply chain because, of course, we've left the European Union um, and therefore created a lot of friction between ourselves and, 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 and suppliers. This is having a devastating effect on many parts of our economy. So I think the second lesson is that um, uh, wherever you happen to be, you've got to make you've got to make every effort to have good relationships um, with um, your suppliers. So protecting your supply chain, and that means uh, good relationships, obviously, with China, for example, if you're in the, the Indochina area or whatever. Um, and I think that is uh, absolutely critical. And the third thing about supply chains, we've seen so easily how they can be disrupted by the incident in the Suez Canal, for example, uh, where the boat basically blocked. Um, and it 
makes us remember that um, supply chains, trade generally, is really intense and it's really significant. Um, and if we don't act in a way that protects those chains, uh, then we'll be at risk. And of course, risks come from all sorts of directions. We're, we're confronting one potentially now, given the uh, uh, situation in, in the Ukraine. Yeah, absolutely. I want to move on now to um, to the point that you are the founder of the Festival of Manufacturing and Engineering. And um, so you, I'm wondering why you were the founder of it. What was what was your motivation for it? And and was it received was it received well? Did people take action? And where is money being spent? Well, <laughs> those are three really good questions. Um, I, when I first became member of Parliament for Stroud, I was absolutely astounded to hear the uh, Association of Secondary Heads tell me that um, uh, the days of manufacturing uh, were pretty much over um, and none of their employee uh, uh, pupils would be heading into manufacturing. Well, even when they said it, I thought they were wrong because I knew that 25% of all jobs in the Stroud district were actually connected to manufacturing. And so I thought to myself, if the schools don't understand the importance of manufacturing, even though they can actually, in most cases, see a factory from their um, staff window, um, uh, how are we going to really uh, get young people to think about uh, jobs in engineering and manufacturing? So that is why I started it off. And we were really successful because what I found was that large numbers of companies across the area um, were really thinking the same thing as I was, that uh, we need more people to come to our factories to, with the skills that, uh, 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 and so on. And so it was really easy for me to get Renishaw um, and, and other great companies uh, to sign up and, and say, we'll support you. Uh, even Airbus down in Bristol uh, were fantastic supporters. And I got support from all over the place, including the Prince of Wales, who came to open one of the uh, festivals. And I was really pleased about that, uh, because I know that he was interested, still is interested in this sort of area. And so to have um, uh, to sort of the future uh, king uh, uh, in Stroud, giving his uh, support uh, of the project was really helpful. So that was why I did it. And that's how it unfolded. Well, so can you tell me what kind of achievements or what kind of insights and knowledge transfer was taking place because of the festival? What do you think people were learning? Was it more a transfer of knowledge to educators so they have an understanding and appreciation of what was going on? Well, that latter point's certainly true. I did, I did um, uh, um, notice that our schools were certainly thinking more about engineering, mathematics, the STEM subjects in general. Uh, so that was good. But what I was most pleased about was actually the number of people who went into apprenticeship schemes with firms, local firms, to uh, proceed down in, in, in there. Um, I've, I noticed that a lot of them were going to Filton to learn about um, aviation with Airbus. Um, Renishaws were really good. They, they recruited large numbers of apprentices, apprentices throughout every year um, and so on. And I saw uh, the traffic of pupils going in their direction. So I was really pleased with the progress and success there. And uh, um, yeah, I, I sorry when I lost my seat that, I first, that, that, that it wasn't going to be uh, as successful going forward. But I certainly feel that that sort of thing is a good thing to do. Yeah, things are often driven by the passion of an individual, aren't they? But you know, Neil, this is, I think this is a common discussion globally about the language between business and educators and closing that gap and the awareness. And so I think there's a big piece in that place that we need to, to, to tackle and, and other countries need to tackle. It's like a completely different language, isn't it? A different look, way to look at things. You're completely right about that. Um, and uh, we really do need to, uh, you know, switch the lights on, so to speak, in, uh, in, in, in both the, uh, world of manufacturing and engineering but of course actually the world of business it's not just the, the making of things but uh, it's everything else as well because i think you you, you learn such a lot by doing that um, and um 
meeting people, learning about their experiences, and actually sometimes seeing the problems and helping to solve those problems is all good uh, for the sector as a whole. So I'm a great believer in, in people working together. And I admire, for example, the German economy, which uh, insists on having chambers which are both statutory um, and compulsory, uh, so that all businesses are involved uh, in, in the sort of relationship building with schools and colleges and so on. And I think that's one of the reasons why the German economy is so much more productive than our own, because uh, the workforce um, is already imbued with the ideas uh, that it needs to have to go forward. But of course, we're not just talking about Europe. And I've started to see the same things when I was in China, um, you know, that sort of real interest in, in understanding the relationship between education and business, especially in the field of robotics, where I was working in. Yeah, I think, I think you're so right. And, and that brings me to that point about trying to create an environment where people are curious to find out more. We had a conversation uh, about at the HR panel and, and that was about um, human resource professionals. Well, there's different levels of human, human resource professionals and, and different disciplines, but about the importance to understand technology, the future of technology and how it can really impact the business, help the business grow or help an organization achieve its objectives. And I think also in the education space, this needs to happen too. I know there are many forward thinking teachers. I know there are brilliant people out there, but we, we, we can't have brilliant people. We, we need more. It needs to be everywhere. Uh, and um, I'll quote um, Rohit Talwar, it needs to be intimate. We need to intimately be, be curious about how we can do things better and how we can serve our clients better, like our students or our employees. So I, I think that using these tools, but also using these tools to understand the more detailed um, tools that you can use in a business like like AI and robotics and so on. I completely agree with you. And I, and I, and I, and I think it's so important to encourage people to be open minded about technology um, and you know, AI, robotics um, and so on are, are are there. When I was at school there, we were learning uh, to multiply and divide with a slide rule. Um, and, um, you know, I remember the argument whether or not a calculator should be used in the classroom. And I thought that um, uh, the attitude to that was really conservative with a small c. You, you need to be more ambitious. You need to be thinking, well, actually, this is a technology which they need to learn. Uh, so they might as well get on with it now. Um, it doesn't mean to say you won't understand the principles of addition and multiplication and so on but you do need to know what a calculator can can do um, and so um, I just would extend that point uh, to say well look whatever technology is coming along uh, we need to embrace it obviously some will fail because some technologies do not succeed but the other key point about technology is today that we think well we've got it all you know we are busy doing this because we've got laptops and all of the rest but tomorrow there'll be a completely new set of technologies uh, which will um, replace the ones we hold dear now. In other words, we've got to be prepared for perpetual change and technology will always develop. There'll be always something new. And my guess is it'll carry on as it has done during the last century in a sort of exponential way. Um, so um, we will um, uh, always be seeing new stuff. And I'm reminded uh, of the um, alleged story about um, President McKinley, who uh, speculated about saving money. And he was told the best way to do that was abolish the patents office because the steam engine, the um, uh, telegraph and repeater rifle had all been invented and there wasn't much else to invent. Well, um, that was in the last, the end of the 1800s. We know what happened next. Um, and we should also therefore understand what might happen tomorrow. And we need to get that firmly embedded in our education system. Yes, and also at the board level in our companies, um, because I'd like people to, to, um, to consider, are they talking about how they can improve what they do with technology at their monthly board meetings? Is there someone there with that agenda? somebody with the responsibility to, to really delve into what competitions are doing or what the possibilities are. Um, and I know a lot of big companies invest a lot of money and they do have people doing this, 
but a lot of the small companies, which is most of our, our business community, small and medium sized organizations, often they don't have time. But I think at this time, it's really critical that they do have it at the board level agenda. So so actually, they're, they're aware, aware that they should be asking these questions and looking for solutions to be more efficient and more effective. You're correct. We're quite right, Christina. And the small and medium sized companies are often firefighting, you know, dealing with things that are happening, um, sort of with, which require emergency action. Um, and the larger firms are more likely to uh, think about the issues um, more holistically, more sort of uh, imaginatively. Um, that gives Britain, at least, a problem because, of course, the number of small businesses we have here is massive as compared to um, other countries. Um, and the number of um, larger firms, what you'd call a Mittelstand in Germany uh, or something similar in, in, in America, is actually much more numerous elsewhere. And so um, we need to think about how we get our firms to grow so that they can actually do that kind of um, big thinking stuff, which you have uh, mentioned, because that's, I think, one of the, the sort of helpful conditions where that big thing, thinking can take place. But all firms need to, uh, you know, take a bit of time to think about technology, think about, you know, the, how the economy is emerging, think about what the workforce is doing and how it might change and so on, because you need to do that. I think this is where there's a good opportunity for the big companies to look after their supply chain and transfer knowledge with their supply chain and make sure they're at the standard they need to be. Well, this takes us right back to the earlier point we were making about the importance of good relationships uh, with supply chains. Because of course, a large company often does uh, have a range of smaller ones producing say one or two things, but one or two things which are really important to the bigger project. Funny enough, Airbus, which I've already mentioned in the context of the Festival of Manufacturing and Engineering, is exactly a case in point. They were looking around my constituency uh, for, for suppliers of paneling and uh, and so forth in in in, in uh, aircraft, um, and uh, Airbus were sensible enough to understand that they had to have a good relationship with their suppliers, so that quality was always um, guaranteed, that um, the product would arrive in time in plenty of numbers, uh, and so on. And and this is crucial that um, the supply, suppliers could adapt changes in, in the aircraft itself. So when new models were being considered or updates were being considered, then change could be easily accommodated. So yes, you're absolutely right. And I think that is a, a very a, a important point and the big corporates yeah. do need thanks. to do it. Thanks a lot, Neil. Now, I know that you have a, a farming background <laughs> a little bit so you could tell us a bit about that and i know that many people involved in this conference also have a lot of involvement in in agribusiness um for most of the countries i go to have more involvement in agribusiness than we do in the uk and i know technology is heavy there so i wanted to ask you can you give us an idea of what the conversations are taking place in that world and where the investment is going which equipment or what the future looks like for agribusiness well, that's a really good question. When I was a farmer um, uh, 25 years ago, um, that's more or less when I stopped being a farmer to go properly into politics. Um, you know, farming was doing quite well. It was a relatively easy to make a profit, certainly in the United Kingdom, because just keep, keep an eye on your marginal costs. But even then, uh, products uh, were becoming, uh, let's say, more refined because the, the consumer was wanting them to be more refined. Um, and technology was also uh, playing a huge role um, in, in making it easier to produce more and more of whatever it is you were producing. So uh, you know, I'm thinking not just of fertilizers and the obvious things like that, but actually techniques and processes as well. Um, now, I have returned to the farm, so to speak, and my aunt uh, Lizzie tells me I'm a hobby farmer, which is absolutely <laughs> right. Um, uh, but I am noticing uh, the huge differences between now and 1998, 99. Uh, one of them, obviously, is, is the impact of farm machinery and uh, the size of it and, and the te technical capacities of it. Um, and uh, clearly, the big machinery manufacturers are, you know, have 
really done quite well. And the interesting thing to note here is those that have developed new products and kept a pace with um, progress, John Deere and New Holland and so on, have really thrived because they've almost created new markets for their products by demonstrating the value of their products. Um, uh, and I think that's a very important point. Um, the other interesting thing is, of course, agriculture, like any other sector, is regulated. But reg ag agriculture is regulated in really quite intense ways because nobody wants to be eating the wrong kind of food um, and, uh, and, and so on. So those so regulations uh, are dominating the world of agriculture uh, in, a, in a way that perhaps they don't dominate elsewhere. Um, and um, I think it's really interesting to, to see how the markets are responding to those sort of circumstances. And that, I think, is something which the sector does need to take into account, because, of course, regulatory situations are different from one place to another. And then, of course, last, last but not least, we mustn't overlook the fact uh, that some people are still hungry um, and the, the system has to um, you know, deal with that particular question. And there are still places in the world, and I've seen them in Myanmar, where uh, processes are as you know as old as the as you know centuries ago, um, and therefore the uh, scale of production is very limited, um, and the quality of, of the food produced is not good. So we have to tackle that as well, and I think it's a great opportunity uh, for uh, business to to help in that field. I, I think that's great that you've mentioned that because although this is Global Digital Week and it's a focus on technology, but it's also a focus on technology and how it can also be a force for good. So, for yeah. example, some of those successful farmers and the advances that they have, they'll have things to contribute to those um, small subsistence farmers in other countries. And again, it's that matching of, of needs and support and how to be a, a, a good company, a good citizen, to transfer the knowledge and, and transfer what you, what, how you how you run your business. Yeah. Well, corporate social responsibility, is, um, uh, or, or whatever you want to call it, um, and people are rightly adding the environment into that, um, is, 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 is a good thing. Um, and because we've all starting to understand just how important it is to look after that, our environment, uh, we have to translate that into actions in the field in terms of agriculture, for instance. Um, and the sensible person recognises that's the obvious thing to do, because what you don't want is the sort of repetition of the Dust Bowl problem in the United States, for example, um, uh, or, or, you know, the toxification of land elsewhere because of other practices which were not appropriate. Um, and so we, we do have to, you know, think about the, most policy areas much more holistically than before. But if agriculture does not respond to the need to, to also protect the environment, then of course it puts itself at risk. Yeah, and I, I think I think Neil, it's not likely that we're going to have as much support from governments. There's a lot on the agenda at the moment. There's always support from governments, but there's nothing better than industries getting together to collaborate and innovate. To, to see how they can do things better as an industry. Um, mm. So I, I think we all have to come together in different ways to contribute to the solution. Yes, we do. You can't just rely on government um, because if we're talking about a global economy, then you've got quite a lot of governments each to you know, think their own ways forward. Um, and so you're not going to get everything as consistent as you might imagine, although there are increasing, there isn't rather increasing evidence that governments are working together uh, to, to uh, bring about good outcomes. Um, but you're quite right. Uh, business has a real opportunity um, and also responsibility uh, to, to work together to, to, to deal with some of these issues. And as I've already pointed out about John Deere and New Holland and so on, manufacturing products which are making agricultural production easier and more uh, efficient but also more environmentally responsible across the whole globe that's a firm businesses looking for the opportunities in that way and that's exactly what they should do but we need to see more of it 
Yeah, that's great. Now, I want to move on to you recently taking on a new role as a chair of Talent ED. Yeah, uh, ta ta talent, uh, yeah, talent head. Um, uh, Ed, is that how it is? Yeah, it's a voluntary role. It, uh, it's, a, it's a voluntary role, but I was proud and pleased to do it. Um, one of the difficulties that we've got in this country is that there are really far too many children who um, are not, uh, um, let's say, uh, getting the best out of the education system because of uh, the impact of social deprivation, inequalities across the uh, area and so on. Um, that is a complete disgrace, really. We need to uh, make sure that everybody has a fair opportunity. That's good for society. It's also good for the economy. Um, and uh, therefore, uh, what, we, what we're doing is saying, look, um, those who need you know, extra support through tutoring, we're going to provide it. Uh, the government is actually supporting this through its national uh, tutor programme. Uh, but we are one of the key deliverers um, and um, we are uh, active in the Midlands, uh, in, in um, London uh, and increasingly in the north. Um, and I'm really pleased that we're helping so many young people, you know, uh, get the best out of themselves uh, for the future that they richly deserve. That's wonderful. It's great that there are so many other players rather than just the traditional educational system. There's a lot of focus. Lots of people are doing different things, different projects to support young people because we recognize it's a different world and, and everybody needs to, to help, especially with, with what's just happened with COVID because they have suffered a lot trying to make sense of what's going on. So, you know, if they were disadvantaged before, it's going to be worse for a period of time. Uh, you, you're completely right. And COVID certainly put the magnifying glass on that um, um, and actually the multiplier as well. But um, we have to face up the fact that for too long, we've had far too many children not being uh, properly uh, supported um, and uh, that is something we uh, need to put right. Uh, I think it requires reform elsewhere in the education system and I'm busy writing a book to explain what those reforms should be um, and uh, um, that will be published in May so stand by for that but uh, um, yes, you know it is really important that we recognize that a child who uh, is born in a nice part of London, is is obviously fortunate and lucky, but a child born in, in in some part of the north or a coastal area, for example, where we know performance is not good, you've simply got to put that right. And we cannot have our people in this country uh, having such a you know detrimental impact to their to the start of their life as we have in as we do have now this applies to other countries as well some less so than us some more so um, and so wherever you are um, the important thing is to look to see if your education system is giving every young person the chance that they need yeah i i, I think you're so right because because you know the educational system can only go so far and i have seen this in other countries and that's why it's so important, as you say, to engage the local stakeholders, people who are now on the ground. They'll have the solutions. They just need a little bit of empowerment, direction or a model to follow something that's been successful in the past. Um, yeah. So I'm pleased to see this taking place. But, you know, the more we can get um, coordinated and more of it, the better we'll, we'll be. Um, mm -hmm. And finally, um, you know, I'd like to, this is my final question about how you keep up with technology. What do you do to stay ahead of the game? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm actually quite interested in technology. Um, you've pointed to my interest in agriculture. I like to see that. Uh, I'm actually interested in energy uh, um, uh, technology. I'm just naturally curious about uh, how we can create things which do a better job than what we've already got. Um, and so when I see that happening, um, I, I, I show interest. I'm not an engineer myself, but um, I have you know, taken things apart, <laughs> I put things together, um, and wondered how they could work uh, in a more efficient manner and so forth. Um, and the other thing that I think is really important is that you use technology in the way that's intended, but also perhaps also in, a, in, in an imaginative way, too, um, because um, that's what I've learned about robotics and artificial intelligence. Um, 
both are kind of talked about um, as if there's some sort of, you know, holy grail. But actually, both can be applied quite easily now uh, to, to, to uh, situations that we've got. Artificial intelligence, for example, in social care arenas uh, to helping people with disabilities. It's a classic example. Uh, and robotics, and not just in repetitive manufacturing, but in, in, in so many other possible ways of helping the environment, for example, uh, by, by, by enhancing the uh, marine life is, is an example. So um, that's what I think we can do with technology. And that's really what I try to do myself. I think you're so, I, I do appreciate your, your insights here, Neil, and for sharing everything with, with our audience today. I've totally enjoyed it. And I think you probably agree that, you know, being curious in this space is really important for everybody. Getting used to using technology to communicate and, and moving over the, the fear, um, I think is also important. There are lots of resources out there, lots of trainings, documentaries, tours, networking. But once you realize the area that you, you're trying, the industry you're in or the area you want to go into, diving deeper and getting yourself in networks where people are talking about these things and all of a sudden you become more knowledgeable knowledgeable about them and i would recommend that would be the way to go for some maybe some of the young students or young entrepreneurs um watching this conference yeah i completely agree with you christina um uh, i think that's exactly right all right well, um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for attention and thank you to Neil Carmichael for giving us his insights and the education panel. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.